Hey YouTube, welcome to another video from practicalnetworking.net. This video is going to explain route precedence and exactly how a router chooses its best path if multiple paths exist. Here's the topology we'll be using. We'll be doing most of our work on R1, and it will be mostly focused on the 9.9.9.128-25 network behind R6. R6 is going to advertise the 9th network via OSPF to R4 and R5, via AIGRP to R3, and via RIP to R2. We're then going to progressively forward those advertisements to R1 to show you exactly what R1 is doing at each step to determine its preferred path to the 9th network. To begin, we're going to have R4 and R5 summarize the slash 25 network as a slash 24 to R1. Now, why we're summarizing it as a slash 24 will make more sense later on in this video. That said, this video is not about route summarization, so we're not going to go into the details of how that is being done. In fact, the configuration of every router has already been completed except for R1. So let's go ahead and enable OSPF on R1 on the links between R1 and R4 and between R1 and R5. Now before I do that, take a look at R1's routing table. You'll notice that at the current time, there are no entries for the 9's network. At this moment, R1 has zero paths to get to the 9's network. We're going to go ahead and enable OSPF on R1 on the link between router 1 and router 4. And we'll do the same for router 1 and router 5. You'll notice as soon as I do that, the neighborship for router 4 and router 5 completes. And before we had zero routes to the 9's network. Now, if I do my show IP route command again, you'll see we currently have two routes to get to the 9's network. Okay, so there are three attributes that are compared when determining route precedence. And right now, they are all tied. Before we show you those three things, I want to show you what a router does when all three of those attributes are identical. First, I'm going to show you a trace route to a network that the router only has one path to. I'm going to do a trace route to the IP address 10.5.6.6, .6, which is router 6's IP address on the link between router 5 and router 6. This is what a normal trace route looks like. When we only have one path, you'll see the first hop on the first line, and you'll see that three packets were sent, each taking a different amount of time to, com to come back. Now I want to show you a trace route to a path that the router has multiple identical paths to. And we'll show you how it's different. Notice the router still sent three packets but something pretty cool is happening. Each of those packets had a different first hop. The first one went through router 4, the next one went through router 5, and the next one went through router 4. What's going on is when the router has multiple identical paths to get to a target network, the router is actually load balancing across those two paths. Right now R1 has two paths to get to the 9's network, one via R4 and one via R5. What R1 is doing is it's sending one packet this way via R4, and the next packet this way via R5, and the next packet this way via R4, and another packet this way through R5. You'll see that it's actually load balancing across both of those paths. This is known as equal cost multipath. And this is what happens when the router has multiple paths with identical attributes to determine route precedence. Now this video is not about equal cost multipath. So what we're going to do is tweak some of the values that are involved in determining route precedence. First, let's take a look at our show IP route again. And you'll see this long output is the output of show IP route. Throughout this video, we're primarily going to be concerned about those two lines. So we're actually going to be using a different command than this one. We're going to do show IP route, but we're going to tell the router to only show us whatever routes match the 9.9.0 slash 24 network or longer prefixes. You'll notice these two lines show up right here. But this way, we can use this command to show us simpler output for what we're looking for. OK, so with that said, let's talk about the three attributes for route precedence. We're going to talk through them backwards. So the last thing that a router looks at when determining route precedence is the metric. The metric is actually visible in the show IP route command. That's this second number in the brackets over here. Both of these routes, learned via OSPF, have a metric of 30. 
Now, the way OSPF calculates the metric is as an additive value based upon each link's speed to the target network. In our topology, all the links are the same speed and have an OSPF cost of 10. That 30 is coming from 10 plus 10 plus 10 for the path through R4, or 10 plus 10 plus 10 through the path through R5. You can see this more clearly if we look at the route in detail in the OSPF database. I can use the command show IP OSPF database summary. Notice we have two paths to the nines network learned via OSPF, one from R4 and one from R5. Both of them have a metric of 20. That's because for R4 and R5 to get to the nines network, it'll cost them 20. R1 then adds the local cost of 10 for its local interface to get a total of 30 in our routing table. So let's go ahead and tweak the cost on the link between R5 and R6 to show you this attribute's effect on route precedence. We'll jump on router 5, and we'll jump on the link between router 5 and router 6, and we'll change the, the OSPF cost to 15 instead of the default of 10. Before, we had two paths to the nines network, both costing 30, one via R5 and one via R4. If I do my show IP route command again, you'll see that the, now we only have one path to get to the nines network. It's this path right here, which remains unchanged. What we did was change this path to make it cost 35. And between a cost of 35 and a cost of 30, R1 preferred the cost of 30, and therefore this is now the only path that R1 will use to get to the nines network. You'll notice now the first hop for all three paths were router four. R1 still knows of the second path, if I do my show IP OSPF database summary command again, you'll see that R4 still has, still advertised the path to the nines network with a cost of 20, and R5 still advertised the path, this time with a cost of 25, because of how we tweaked the metric on the link between R5 and R6. When router one got this route, it added 10, its local interface cost, and when router one got this route, it also added 10, giving us a, metric, a total metric of 30 through R4, or 35 through R5, and between those, the one that it preferred is the one through R4 with a metric of 30. So R1 currently has two paths to get to the nines network. One costing 30 through R4, and the other one costing 35 through R5, and between the two of them, it preferred the path through R4 because that is a lower metric. The next thing that the router looks at for route precedence is what's known as the administrative distance. The administrative distance is an arbitrary value associated with each method of learning routes. The administrative distance is actually visible in the routing table. That's the other number in this bracket. You'll notice that the OSPF has an admin distance of 110. There are many ways to learn routes in the routing table, and each of them has a different administrative distance that is used to compare the different methods of learning routes. All OSPF routes will always have an admin distance of 110. Now to show you the effect of administrative distance on route precedence, we're gonna to have to learn of the nines network from another path. So we're gonna have R3 forward a route via EAGRP to 9.9.9.0 slash 24. Once again, the configuration on R3 has already been done. So I'm gonna jump on R1 I'm going to enable EIGRP for the network between router 1 and router 3, and we'll take a look at what changes. You'll notice as soon as I enable the network, a neighbor adjacency forms with R3, and before I had one route learned via OSPF, which had an atom distance of 110, and now I have still one route, but this one was learned via EIGRP, that's what that D means, and the EIGRP route has an admin distance of 90. EIGRP has an admin distance of 90, which is better than OSPF's 110. Now the router still knows of the OSPF routes. I can still do my show IP OSPF 
database summary command, and you'll see we still have a route through R4 with a cost of 20, and a route through R5 with a cost of 25, which means at the moment, R1 knows of three ways to get to the 9's network. It can go via R5, which was learned via OSPF with a cost of 35, via R4, which was learned via OSPF with a cost of 30, and between those two, this was the better route because it had a better cost. Router 1 also learned of the path through the 9's network from EIGRP through R3, and between these two, it preferred the path through Router 3 because it had a better admin distance. And you can see that if you do a trace route to the 9's network, you'll see, in all cases, the first hop was Router 3. Now we're going to learn about yet another path to the 9's network, this time from RIP. RIP has an administrative distance of 120, which is worse than EIGRP's 90. But notice something crucial. The EIGRP and OSPF routes were summarizing the slash 25 route as a slash 24, whereas RIP is sending the route as a slash 25. So let's go ahead and take a look and see how that changes the route precedence. Prior to me enabling RIP, this is the route that R1 knows about. It was learned via EIGRP. I'll go ahead and enable RIP. And before, I had this route learn via EIGRP. Now, if I do my show IP route command, you'll see I currently still have that route. That route was unchanged. It still exists just like before, still learned via EIGRP. But I now have an additional route, the slash 25 from RIP. Notice RIP's administrative distance is 120 compared to EIGRP's 90. That is worse. So you would think the EIGRP route would take precedence, but it doesn't because the number one thing the router looks at for route precedence is the most specific route. A slash 25 is more specific than a slash 24. So this RIP route with the worst administrative distance is chosen over the AIGRP route. And you can see this in a trace route. You'll notice the first hop in each case was router 2. Even though packets sent to 9.9.9.129 technically match both of these routes, the most specific route always takes precedence. So there you have it. That covers everything a router uses to decide which path to take when multiple paths exist. The number one thing that breaks all ties is route specificity. The most specific route always takes precedence. If there are two routes with the same specificity, the next thing that is looked at is the administrative distance. And a lower administrative distance is better. If there are two routes with the same size and the same admin distance, the next thing that breaks ties is the metric. And again, a lower metric is better. And finally, if all three of these are identical, the router will simply load balance across any available paths. Now, before I let you go, I have a couple bonus questions for you to test whether you actually understood all this. Let's say I add a static route that looks like this. For the 9.9.0 slash 24 network pointing via router 5. This static route is telling R1 that to get to the 9's network, go via R5. Now I should say that a static route has an administrative distance of 1. With that said, I have two questions for you for what will happen if I add this static route. The first question is, if I add this static route, what will happen to the routing table? What entries will be added and what entries will be taken away? The second question is what path will R1 take if I do a trace route to the 9.9.9.129 IP address? Go ahead and post your answers in the comments section. I'll answer the question officially with another video that I'll release next week, which is also a good reminder to say that if you enjoyed this content, please subscribe and share to encourage me to keep publishing videos. That's it for now. I look forward to reading your answers in the comments below. Otherwise, thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.